So we were to start looking at um, emergency shutdown and process shutdown before the break. And why is, and why is, can you mute your mic? Are you mute your mic? And why is this important? Because um, there might be a time where there will be need to protect staff, equipment, or the environment from um, consequences of abnormal operating conditions, which can come due to blowouts, um, like when we have release of hydrocarbon, or natural conditions like the hurricane that we spoke about last class. All right, and we want to just close the system. So the button or that makes this possible is what we call the emergency shutdown or the process shutdown. All right, so um, this action initiated will be selective and in line with the requirements of the actual situation to limit the effects on the subsever to a minimum. So when we are to carry out this shutdown process, it's good to allow the system to shut down as it is being programmed because abrupt shutdown can damage our valves. So that is what that second point is trying to tell us. Uh, we might have an emergency, but it's also good to uh, allow the system to shut down properly. Okay, in the next slide, we will see the time sequence to that. So, but we should know at this point that there is buttons that we can use to adequately shut down system uh, to mitigate against consequences of uh, release of hydrocarbon or other accidents or natural disaster occurrences. And we have two distinct shutdown protection mechanism, which we call the emergency shutdown and the process shutdown. So no that too. So if you are asked the two distinct uh, shutdown system for protection of equipment, now you know. So when we talk about the process shutdown, what are we talking about? We're talking about the shutdown that is being initiated when we have fire or gas detection. And also when we have release of unacceptable amount of hydrocarbon, we can activate the emergency shutdown. Also we have what we call the process shutdown, which is initiated to avoid situations by protecting our process equipment from abnormal operating conditions. So, what is a typical sequence of uh, a shutdown? So we have the level one and level two. Level one, which is uh, abandoned platform shutdown. This is initiated by the operator on the platform. Then we have level two, which is emergency shutdown, also initiated from the platform. Then we have a template manifold shutdown from a walkover rig telemetry system. We have manual initiated shutdown. This can be carried out by um, an intervention equipment like our ROV if it is in close proximity with our subsea production system. Okay. So the first one is well shut down from the tree. The second one is um, template or manifold shutdown from our manifold. And I must say here also that our manifold also have uh, assemblage of valves that we can use to short flow, okay? In fact, some manifold even have choke as well to regulate flow of hydrocarbon from the manifold. So not only do we have um, 
valves and chokes on the trees, but we also have them on the manifold. All right. So we also have. Um, all right. Excuse so me. We also have. Um, so, so what is the main distinction between the manifold and the tree? And the what? And the what? And the tree, sir. Okay. So, the manifold is, for example, like your. So the manifold, is, for example, like your house that you have in your house. You have in your house. Can you mute your mic? It's causing echo. So, like what? Are you in your mic? Yes, sir. We are with our mic, sir. I said, can you mm -hmm. mute it? It's causing echo. Okay, I think it's better now. So I was saying that your manifold is like the water storage tank that you have in your houses, from where you can commingle flow. While your Christmas tree is like your tap, the head of the tap in your house. All right, from where you can short flow, open flow. All right, that's what we call the Christmas tree. While your manifold is just like a storage tank where you have several Christmas trees and they can deposit their contents into the manifold. Is that understood? Yes, sir. Since the Christmas tree sits on your well also, your Christmas tree is also the device that allows us to carry out what we call re-entry into the well because it is the cap for your well. So it is from your Christmas tree that you can carry out intervention work, that you can carry out workover operations on a particular well. Exactly. Yes, sir. All right. So we also have an automatic well shutdown at low pressure that can be done from our subsea control module, either low pressure or high pressure from the SCM. We also have a well shutdown, automatic shutdown at low well head pressure, also from the SCM. Then we also have a automatic shutdown due to low pressure from flow line detected by platform systems. Then lastly, we have automatic well shutdown due to losses of electric power to control module. So there's something that we call fail safe close in subsea operation. We call it fail safe close, meaning that in an event whereby we lose electrical power or hydraulic power, our valve should fail by closing up the well. So that is what we have in this last line, where we say automatic shutdown due to loss of electrical power to control module. So the major valve of the Christmas tree and or the manifold in some cases, once there is a, uh, a failure in a power system, it will shut in. So for Christmas tree, it is fail safe close, while for manifold, it is fail assist, meaning that when there's a failure, the valve will just be the way it is to allow drainage from our manifold pipelines. Okay. So next we have um, our ESD slash PSD valves can signal, give us signal to when there is um, an operation on the Christmas tree, all right? So when we have an abnormal um, operation that calls for shutting in, this signal can be seen on the human machine interface top side and the ESD or the PSV as the case may be, can be acted upon to shorten our well. Okay. 
So PSD signal are usually acts as a separate control mechanism. And you can see, as I was saying in the last slide, the ESD function shall be as fail to close. So once there's a failure, the valve closes automatically. All right? If a permanently energized solenoid valve is included in the control module, ESD function may be executed by means of interrupting electrical power to the SCN if it is a solenoid activated valve because the solenoid valve is being electrically charged. But if it is a dumb valve that it is hydraulic, we usually use a spring, okay? Um, hydraulic to spring valve so that once there's a failure of hydraulic, the, free, the spring will be energized to close the valve. Okay, so let us move on. PSD signal shall act via the SCU subsea control unit, enable us to have a sequence closure of subsea valve as required in the various PSD level. So lastly, on the emergency shutdown and process shutdown, this emergency shutdown system must be possible to activate emergency shutdown. Okay, and this shutdown shall be automatically sequenced such that the system is shut down safely and we cut the release of hydrocarbon to the environment. So we have what we call the ESD panel that is provided at different panels located on board the rig to enable us to carry out ESD operation in a case where we have fire or release of hydrocarbon on the rig floor. All right, and our PSV, uh, PSD or ESD are usually close the valve. So don't forget that, close the valve fast enough to avoid overpressurization of our line, okay? Due to topside shutdown. So that's the element for, for that. Next, we have the tutor. And this is what the tutor looks like. Also a more like a panel box with different gauges and valves underneath. And just like I said, who can remind me um, all the things that we have at the junction of the tutor? So I want you guys to talk. What do we have? HPU PLC. Okay, HPU. Yes. UPS and MCLC. Yes, good. What else? Sorry. What SPC, else? The, the subsea power control units. Good. What else? There's one more. The MCS. Master control station. Master control station. All right. So that's fine. And you can see here, they say it provides interface between our main umbilica and the top side control equipment, such as the EPU, HPU, chemical injection unit. And it's usually located near the umbilical gel tube on the host. So after here now, the underneath it, you have what we call the J-tube. The J-tube is just a point where all the lines, all these lines will come together and are warmed into one. And that is just like the termination points that we spoke about earlier on. Okay? Like your bend stiffener. That is what the J-tube looks like. From the J-tube, you now have your umbilical and everything is taken down into the point where you are going to lash to your subsea equipment. Okay? So, these units are usually tailor made to meet specific uh, facility requirements. So, there is no one way that fits it all. No, 
depending on what you want to function, that will determine the requirements for your uh, tutor because it depends on what is coming into this junction box or the constituent of your umbilical that will be represented into this junction box. Okay? So let's move ahead. So here we have our electrical tutor. Here we have our hydraulic tutor. And just from this picture, you will see the slim shape is coming where we have our J2, all right? So tutor has what we call the electrical junction box and the optical junction box for electrical power and communication cables, all right? So this terminates the electrical umbilical and the hydraulic panel with valves or gauges for appropriate hydraulic and chemical supplies. So this also includes enclosure, which is stainless steel to ensure that nothing is uh, more like a protection for the constituents of the uh, electrical and as well the hydraulic. And this also is certified um, to ensure that we don't have any ingress like water, like spill, hydraulic, to fit into the particular location where you have operation. So, tutor also have valves which must comply with uh, flammable services as stated by the fire testing standard. And what does that say? Typically, our tutor function include hydraulic, chemical, and electrical terminations, a bulkhead plate interface for chemical and hydraulic termination. This is what we call a bulkhead, this one here. All right. Then uh, insulation, block and bleed valves, provided for all hydraulic and chemical lines. So just like you have the tap for the hydraulic and chemical, you can have block and bleed valves, connections to power, connections for our power and communication electrical quad, then connections for our hydraulic and chemical circuit lines, which can be pressurized up to 15,000 PSI. So do we have any questions on tutor? Any question? No, sir. All right. So next we have our HPU. This helps us to provide stable and clean supply of hydraulic to our remotely operated subsea valve. All right. And this fluid <coughs> is supplied via our control umbilical. the subsea hydraulic distribution system and our FCN, if included in the system diagram to operate our subsea actuators. And you can see an example of HPU, all right? Provides electrical uh, hydraulic power to hydraulic to move them from top side to subsea. Functional part of our HPU, one is the accumulators. These are the ones in blue. Okay, so these are pressure storage reservoir. Okay, in which a non-compressible hydraulic fluid is kept under pressure for uh, emergency shutting operation. So when we are ramping up or starting our uh, HPU, this can pro provide a clean surge of pressure to move our valves while we are starting up our pump on the HPU, okay? And 
We also have uh, ISO certification standard for sizing of accumulator and we have it as displayed, all right? So, uh, we have 13628-6, 2016, which states, all valves on one subsidy tree to be open and closed without requiring recharge of the accumulator, prevent short runs or short pump uh, run circles, then our HPU should have a minimum of two 37 liters accumulator for common low pressure header and two 10 liter accumulator for common high pressure header. So these are design considerations. You don't need to cram them. If you are to carry out any design, all you need to do is to refer to this ISO standard and every information that you need will be provided henceforth. So another functional part of our HPU is what we call the pump. And this is what the pumps looks like. Hydraulical pump, which provides mechanical source of power to convert our mechanical power into hydraulic energy. That is hydrostatic energy, i.e. flow pressure etc. Hydraulic can deliver both, no, this is not both, it's both. Let me correct that. Both uh, high pressure and low pressure uh, capabilities. And it can help us control our devices okay with what we call uh, off and on pressure within operating limits another component of our hpu is the reservoir and this is the tank where we store hydraulic fluid and as a minimum when we are carrying out this design you can note this the capacity of the reservoir should be 1.5 times the volume of hydraulic that is needed to service the entire surface or subsea accumulators, one, umbilicals, two, and all operational valves in one full open and closed circle of choke. So when we are citing out a field, the reservoir should have capacity to take at least 1.5 times the volume of hydraulic that will go through all the umbilica, that will go through our surface and subsea accumulator and all operational valves in one circle. Take note. Then, hydraulic fluid reservoir should be equipped with a visual level indicator to know the level of um, hydraulic in this particular reservoir. Then also, the hydraulic fluid tank should be designed to minimum build up of contamination and facilitate flushing. So before we have this reservoir, we also have a filter system that is put up on the tank just to ensure that whenever we are having a recycling, of hydraulic maybe moving from system back into the reservoir, any debt is being trapped behind and that debt is not entering into our tank. Our tank should be as clean as possible. So consideration should always be give, also be given to the use of two fluid reservoir, one used to transport new fluids, then the other one for return fluid from subsea, all right? So all these design requirements is stated in our ISO standard. And you just need to consult it as engineers whenever you want to carry out maybe reservoir sizing or you want to design for your subsea control systems. So next we have um, control and monitoring of our HPU. 
So this can be done locally via the HPO control panel, which you can see on the panels. Let me see if we have another one here. Yeah, so if you look at this, you will see some gauge, panel gauge by this side on the topmost side here. All right? So you can do control and monitoring from there. So, and this should include non-regulated supply pressure. It should be monitored. Regulated supply pressure should be monitored. Fluid level should be monitored. Pump status. Delivery flow rate should be monitored. Return flow. Filter status. And as well, ESD indicators. And what are ESD? What is the full meaning of ESD? What is the full meaning of ESD? Emergency shot. All right, good. Shut down. Very good. So, we can also employ um, HVU when we are doing heavy lifting and systematical lifting. Any operation that involves ramping up of pressure using hydraulic fluid is where we have our HPU functional or relevant, all right? And also we can use it to provide high pressure. We can also use it for pressure testing, flushing and function testing of subsea equipment. Do we know what these three things mean? Do we know what it means? So what three things? Do we know what pressure testing, <clears throat> flushing, and function testing means? Um, so I think the thing is, uh, when you pass a fluid... Who is talking? Let me know who is talking. This is Salim, sir. Salim, where are the other two guys? They are the only one talking since morning. They are, they are here. So we are here, sir. Why have you guys not been contributing? So we're talking. You're talking, sir. Uh, uh, who is that? Who is on the line now? It's Emmanuel, sir. Okay. So, um, yeah, Emmanuel. Pressure Emmanuel. test. Emmanuel. Pressure okay. test, I think, from, from, from what you said yesterday. Um, it's just the testing of the flow lines, um, whether um, the pressure. Whether um, um, fluid can pass through the flow lines. What's the name of that? So I just generally testing of the, pre, um, the flow lines. Oh. Just what? testing of the flow generally the testing of the flow lines of the pipe. Okay. Okay. Who else? Manuel have told us something. Where is the third guy? What is that his name again? Sam yes, sir. Uh, Sam yes, sir. Derek, Derek. Derek, you have been very quiet. So yes, tell us your own opinion. I've been listening, sir. Uh, 
Pressure testing is a kind of um, non-destructive testing that is used to you know, test the integrity of, of flow lines or, or, or piping equipment uh, yeah, to ensure um, free flow of fluids and hydrocarbons. That's fine, that's fine. We'll take that from you. Thank you. So that is for pressure testing. So how about for, uh, let me see the next one. Flushing. 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 How about for flushing? Answer. Okay, I think flushing has to do with reading the system of any form of debris or contaminant. Okay. Okay. So, usually, you are right. You are very correct. Usually, when we have it, um, what do you say? Size, 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 flushing can be called pigging. What do you say? Size, can flushing also be termed as um, pigging, you know, um, um, passing them. Can it be termed as what? I didn't get that. Act of like making fluids, uh, flowing fluids. <laughs> Picking. Picking is different. Can it be also can it also be called digging? I don't know what digging. Digging. No, pigging. P I. I don't yeah. Okay, pig, use of pigs. Pig. Okay, pigging. Yeah. So for pigging, you use pigs, all right, to clean up your flow lines. But when we talk about flushing, right. we use hydraulics. All right. All right. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So lastly, we have function testing. So what is function testing? Um, so I, I think function test is like a test that is carried out to ensure that the subsea equipment and they perform within the uh, allowable working parameters. Okay. Um, so, I, so I can give an example, like um, when you stated that uh, before they carry out every equipment, they do a check, they have a big logbook where they, I think that can be termed as function testing, where they test. When they do what? To check if everything is in order or all the checkmates are. Yes, so, so you made, so I was trying to say, you gave us an example where you said they, is a big logbook like most technicians use to check if the subsea equipment are working properly. So they tend to, uh, and you said it can take like three days or so. So can that be tagged as function testing? Okay. So part of it, yes, but not all. Some are just inspection. All right. You can also have pressure testing. You can also have flushing, you can also have function testing. So when we talk about function testing, we are simply saying that you are using hydraulic pressure to move a moving part. Remember when we talked about uh, piston yesterday? Yes, yes. So when you pass pressure at one point and your piston moves out of position, and when you remove the pressure, 
your PST moves in. We can term that as a function test. So when you have an equipment that have a movable part, whereby you alter the direction of that part using hydraulic, we call that a function test. Just to ensure that that part is moving as it should be. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Good. So let's move on. So next we have the MCS. You've been hearing of the MCS since morning, and this is the MCS now. So this is the unit that controls and monitor our subsidy production system. It has range in complexity from our manual hydraulic panel to automated computer system. So the one here is usually the automated computer system. Okay. Uh, and you'll be surprised to see manual hydraulic panel here. So for very simple systems, very simple system or very simple line, you can just have a hydraulic panel where you can open and shut in valve to serve as your MCS. We call such system full hydraulic system, whereby it has no element of electrical um, backup or control to it. Is that clear? But yes, in, a, in a situation whereby we have um, electro hydraulic or even fully electrical system, you have to have the MCS whereby our computers are being programmed and automated to carry out um, operations, okay, on our soft sea equipment. So MCS may be the central control node containing application software required to control and monitor the subsidy production system and associated top size system, such as our HPU and our EPU. Let me see if I can make this bigger. So, can you see this? When you get the notes, you can see it better. So we have the control room. We have the HMI, which we call the human machine interface. This is the redundancy. We have our switch boxes, keyboard, we have monitor, we have mouse. And on the platform control, we have our uh, input power, HPU, EPU. Then in the MCS cabinet, we also have keyboard monitor switches, SPCU and MCS, which is the master control station. So everything is interlinked. And it is all these things now that you now have as an output to our umbilical, okay? So let's move on. So MCS configuration, fully integrated to the host of direct control system, such as a standalone terminal being the primary interface for control, and as a standalone terminal with interface of both uh, direct control system and subsea control system, the host DCS is the primary, while the MCS is the secondary. So if you look here, for example, we have control room, we have MCS cabinets. One can serve as primary, the other one will serve as redundant. That is what this slide is telling us. Host direct control system and a standalone primary interface. So you can read all that by yourself when you get the notes. There's no big issues to it. So what are the main capabilities of our MCS? Operates safely in controlled sites, respond to our host safety system. And what is an example of the host safety system that we can say is being put in place on the top side? 
another example of that. Hello? Hello, guys. So with you, sir. Yeah, with me, but you're not answering my question. What is an example of a safety system that we have on top side on our vessel that we've spoken about today? Uh, surface interface. Yeah. You talked about a fail safe valve. Yeah, it can be top side also. So, BOP, BOP can be top side and it's 50% of the safety. Safety system. Hello, sir. The UPS to provide backup electricity. I don't know. Later we can ask you. All right. So, um, Kachi, let me hear from you. Okay, I mentioned like um, the fail safe. You know, the fail safe device I talked about earlier. And yeah. also the UPS, which provides backup power. You are close. So what makes the fail safe possible? What devices activate the fail safe? What device activates the fail safe? The hydraulic unit. Have you heard of the ESD before? Okay, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Does it ring a bell? Yes, I does. Uh -huh. So that is what answers that question. So it is the ESD or the PSD that will activate the fail safe close or fail safe open, which you are talking about. And that is what answers the question okay okay sir thank you all right perfect so let's go on so we also have um provide effective operational interface from top side to our subsea equipment, display and warns of out of limit or fault conditions. This is how we know if we have some form of fault along the line, it will tell us by a beeping light on the display system. Also display operating status to show if it is green, everything is fine, all right? And also provides a shutdown capability. We can also shut in our um, well for our MCS. Other optional capability is sequence operation of valves, software interlock, process controlled interlock, data collection, data storage, data analysis and presentation, remote communication of offsite control, interface with uh, remote shutdown system, 
uh, rate of change of pressure analog, hydro detection, and flow rate control. All right? So all these are the capabilities of our MCFs. So you can see that it's doing a lot for us. So example of systems that can be controlled by MCS, we have our electrical power units, our modem units, UPS, and our HPU, all right? So this is just showing us schematic of flow of how MCS can operate alone or in conjunction with other equipment as the case were. So let's look at scenario one, direct control, I was control system, master control system as in one unit or one panel to our SCM. Where is our SCM located? Where is our SCM? Inside the subsea control module. Aha. Uh -huh. SCM. Very good. You guys are following slide. Today's one is entering very well. You see why it's good for you to do flip yes, study? Yes, it's entering. And if you didn't do flip study now, you won't be getting all these things. Then from our SCM, which is inside our SCM, which is already subsea to the final equipment to be controlled. This might be a valve. This might be a, anything, all right? And this gateway is the umbilicals. All these lines are our umbilicals, okay? So you can have it direct. You can have all of the system to be as a standalone, all right? Then you can also have your fiber optics connection also as a standalone. So these are all different configuration of our master control station. So next we have um, what we call the multi-phase flow meter. So simply, this is just a device that is used to measure flow rate of oil, gas, and water through a pipe session without having to separate them, just to measure them and know what is flowing in what. So some multiphase flow meter uses partial separation of liquid and gases upstream, all right? And this is what our multiphase flow meter looks like. And for design of our multi-phase flow meter, we have ISO 13628, API 17B, API 6A, and NAIS compliance standard to make our flow meter. We won't spend much time on this. So this is just the different components of the multi-phase flow meter. You can read that up by yourself. All right. And at this junction, we have gone through the control system. You have seen all the places where the umbilical branches off. Then we can start to look at our umbilical at this point in time. So let's take a 10, 15 minute break. We'll come back and we'll start looking at umbilical. But before I go, any question? At this point, none for most. All right, very good. That means you guys are following. So let's take 10, 15 minute break. So we'll meet by by 2.50 and we'll continue. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, so now we we'll start to look at um, umbilical and this presentation and soft skill ones are going to drive us or help us drive our learning towards that. So when we say umbilical, what are we talking about? 
So umbilicals are simply a group of electrical and or optical cables, plastic hoses, steel tube, which can be either on their own or in combination with each other, and cables together for flexibility using oversheets and armor where required for mechanical strength for the sole purpose of transmitting electrical, hydraulic, and signals, and also receiving the same top side. And from this picture, we have um, an example of a cut through of an umbilical. And you can see the armor. You can see the outer sheet or the jacket. Then you can see support in white, which we call the fillers. You can see hydraulic hoses. And you can see electrical cable. All right, that's electrical cable. So this is just an example of an umbilical. So when we talk about umbilical, what are the function or purpose of an umbilical? Purpose of an umbilical is to provide safe and efficient solution for interconnection of topside hosts which can include a platform, a vessel, land-based structure to our subsea equipment, including control system, Christmas tree, manifold, valve, and pumps located at the sea floor. All right? So an umbilical can supply one or a combination of the following. These are mostly the things that our uh, umbilical can help us supply. First is electrical signal, which can either be low voltage power, hydraulic power, chemical injection purposes, optical data transmission, middle voltage, and as well, gas load. Yesterday I spoke about gas load. Do you remember what I said gas load is? Said is a means or technique used for increasing the flow. Flow rate of production. Hmm? Yes. All yes. right. So that means the means that which we use to take that gas to that point where we are going to make uh, the production to. Uh, to increase the flow rate, you can also use an umbilical at that point. So, what does an umbilical do? Supplies hydraulic pressure to our valve actuation. Now we are getting to know this more pressure accumulation, pressure intensification. And if you can just take some thoughts backward, you see that we've talked about some of this equipment during our sub subsea control systems that we just concluded, All right? So now this is to make you run faster as you go along with these notes. Secondly, to supply our low voltage electrical power to the SCM and as well help us control our production valves. All right. Also provides control system signals, communication. So once we say shut a well or shut a valve, how do we know if it is actually shut or not? We get signal from the equipment back to top side. 
uh, it is still the umbilical that ensure we have that true communication, which we call the back and forth, to send signal and to receive feedback. Provides a link to and from our control, uh, control system sensors. So we can use it to power our sensors, we can use it to get links from sensor and also to get information back top side. All right. Then also to inject chemicals into our Christmas tree, our wellhead, and our flow lines. So when do we need to inject chemicals in our Christmas tree, our wellhead, or our flow lines? When uh, we have flow assurance issues. Yes. So what can cause, what are the things that can cause flow assurance issues? Uh, carbonate scales, hydrates, corrosion. Shields. Okay, so you are very correct. Shields. Emmanuel. Shields. I have a question for Emmanuel. Okay, sir. So which operational condition can warrant us to do chemical injection to our trees? Well head, do none. Sorry, sir. Come again, sir. I said, which operations can warrant us to do chemical injection for our well, our trees, or our flow line. When we have flow assurance issues. Yes, we've heard about that. Uh, Salim have said that, but that is not all. There are some operations that can warrant us to do chemical injection. That is what I'm asking. Derek, you want to help him? Um, so what about when, uh, when you want to like make well intervention? Yes, well, that is one. Very correct. Another one. Um, um, yeah. I want to do, do testing. So I want to do testing. <laughs> no, not really. So when we are having a, a shutdown or a well restart, we also do chemical injection. So you want to shut down your well, all right? Maybe carry out, change out, or to move away from production because of uh, a natural disaster, then you have to do chemical injection, all right? Or if you want to restart your well after a long shutdown, you won't just open production because your system is already cold, because it was at low temperature to the environment. If you just restart your system, you can have flow assurance issues. So you have to warm up your system. And how you warm up your system is by chemical injection through your critical equipment, like your Christmas tree, your wellhead, and your flow lines. Understood? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So, also, when you want to do venting operations, when you want to vent flow line, and use your umbilical, when you want to supply pressure to the subsea isolation valve and subsea safety valve, use the umbilical. 
when we want to carry out medium voltage power for pumps and other equipment, we use our umbilical. So you can see plenty uses of the umbilical. So if I tell you to give me five views, I expect you to be able to answer with ease that challenge. And here we have a schematic to show us our soft layout with our umbilical. So you can see you have your master control station working together with your electrical power units in conjunction with your chemical injection units, in conjunction with your HPU, all right? Then from here, you have power and signal to our tutor. Then you have your hydraulic directly terminating to your tutor, and you have chemical injection that terminating to your tutor, okay? All this comes in as a connector and enter into the this device, what do I call this device? Let me see what you need to remember. One point. One point. Sorry, Sorry sir. I'm coming. I want to draw the circle. What do I call this point? Oh. One point going. Hydraulic connectors. Going, going. Sir, sir, please come again. What do you call what? The point highlighted. This point. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Somebody saying wait, wait. Uh, It's going, you know. Right. Public house. <sighs> it can't be that easy now, don't you think so? Manifold, sir. Okay. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Are you sure you are my student? <laughs> I know you cannot get it. That's why I asked him. So remember, I, I was talking about the end termination from the tutor, and I caught something the change. Speed. Okay. So that is the J two. That is the what? J two. Is the end termination. You said is a line on the Twitter where all the lines come in. Yeah, it's J tube, so it is where all your lines from the Twitter terminate. And from there, you now have your umbilical in yellow. All right, and here you now have your umbilical from the top side to wherever the uh, subsea. Equipment are all right. Then from your umbilical, you now have termination points to your umbilical termination assembly. Then from your umbilical termination assembly, you have connection to your flying lead. From your flying lead, you now have connection to your SEM. And this side, your SEM, you have what? The S E. Good. So you now have your S E M. M. All right, which is this sensors. All right. Then from there you can. Sir. Yes. So I wanted to ask you. Uh, can you please remind us the function of the fly leads? The fly leads. Yes. The fly leads is just connectors. All right, that helps you carry both on uh, hydraulic 
electrical power uh, signal from your source information assembly to the Christmas tree or to the manifold. If you look at it here, you will see you will see the line in blue and red. Can you see it? Blue and red, yes, I can see blue and red. So blue means hydraulic, red means uh, electrical. Exactly. Yes, sir. So you can now see the significance of what we are doing since morning. The umbilical cannot work alone. It has to carry something from this guy's top side and transmit them to this guy's subsea. So broadly, you can say that we have characterization of our umbilical into either static or dynamic umbilical. All right. So, when do we say an umbilical is static? And when do we say an umbilical is dynamic? Are we together? Mm. Yes, so perhaps when well, when your systems are operational and you are passing hydraulic fluid and electrical signals. If I tell you the answer to this question, you are going to knock yourself three times. Huh. That, uh, that tell you the answer. Not yet, sir. Okay. Somebody should try it. I'm starting to play to the seabed. Yes, why dynamic umbilicals? They are connected to the, what do you call it? The FSO. Or floating, floating bodies. Floating bodies. So who, who wants to answer me so that I'm not getting for us answer? Okay, sir. So if combine sir, according to our combined effort, <laughs> we believe that uh, the dynamic umbilical <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> is used for connecting floating body with maybe the uh, subsea equipment. Okay. Why the, the static umbilical is, is, is fixed, is at, fixed the at the seabed? Connecting the subsea equipment. Okay. So for once, I think your combined effort worked for you. Paid off. Thank you for the extra point, sir. Combined <laughs> <laughs> effort. I didn't say you guys are doing any group work yet. <laughs> so you guys are correct. So what you have, that means what you have here is an example of, um, just a minute. So that means what you have here is an example of a dynamic umbilical. So anything that carries power signal hydraulic from top side, just hitting the seabed is a dynamic umbilical. And any umbilical that continues on that route, maybe from a uh, termination assembly that we have here to other locations on the seabed 
is what we call a static umbilical. Is that clear? Yes, sir. All right. So let's move on. And it says here that although in many cases we can lead to uh, they can lead to complex design concerns. In most cases, static umbilicals are less demanding in terms of their system design as compared to dynamic umbilical. All right? So you can deploy them from a shore based facility and run out along the seabed with the subsea equipment when existing equipment is in place, all right? So, uh -huh. and they also called up the J2 here. So they say in shallow waters, umbilicals can be deployed from a static to a source of development. And this type of umbilical is installed inside a J2, fitted to the host, can you see that? This tube is intended to protect the umbilical from physical effects of wave actions at the platform. Okay, then in some cases, umbilicals are used to distribute power, chemicals, communication from offshore systems and platforms. So, Let's look at distinct uh, differences. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, the uh, static umbilical, sir. Yes. Sir, uh, what fixes them to the uh, seafloor? I, I can see like they have uh, kind of uh, foundation structures that fix them to the sea, sea floor from this schematic I can see something like that. Static umbilicals are not fixed to the sea floor. They are not? Yes. So would they not be prone to like uh, movement and eventually burial? Not really. Okay. The movements are not significant. Subsea. Okay. But in a place where you have very few locations where you have earth movements, then they can be secured. But 99% of the time, you just roll them out okay. and you drop them on seabed. Uh, all right. So, sometimes referred to as seabed umbilicals. Can you see? Static umbilicals are required to be negatively buoyant, unless on bottom stability is achieved by another method, and may be armored with layers of armored wire for torque balance, tensile strength, and weight for seabed stability. Static umbilicals are laid on the seabed and have no requirement to take any dynamic loading. They are most often used to connect main subsea umbilical to a satellite manifold, which in turn branches out to other three facilities. So you can see, when you have your main umbilical from the structure downward, static umbilical will pick up the job and distribute to other facilities. And the configuration that we have, we have shore to seabed. Why do we say shore to seabed is a static umbilical? Sorry, sir. Why do you sure to seabed is a static umbilical? Uh, 
So perhaps because it, it, it doesn't need to be. Yeah, it like it's just lead on the sea floor. It's still it's still running along the along the earth, like yeah. it's not moving freely due to the movement of the waves. Perfect. That is the answer. So anything. So it's still it's, on the ground. It's yeah. still supported by the earth. Yeah. Then secondly, uh seabed to seabed. That one is straightforward. Then platform. Platform to seabed. Why are we saying platform to seabed is is static umbilical? I'm waiting. Um, probably if we're talking about a fixed form. Uh, I can't hear you. If the platform you're referring to is a fixed platform, then it, it doesn't have any, the, the waves doesn't have any effect on it. So it's still static. Uh, well, so we have, so you have spoken about the platform, you are right, but how what is the effect of the platform or what's the relationship between the platform and the umbilical that will make it static that's my question okay the platform be... go ahead it's also fixed to the seabed you are still talking about the platform so so i think there has to be something that will like keep it in place stationary and not prone to like movement from environmental forces. Exactly, you have to, you can fasten your umbilical to your fixed platform so that it will just form like how you do your house wiring, whereby you clip, you clip the wire to the wall. So along your fixed platform, you can fasten your umbilicals, all right? So that, like uh, Salim has just said, it shouldn't be exposed to ocean and wave current. Do you understand? Okay, sir. Uh, then lastly, we have platform to platform, which is obvious. You have a platform, you have a gang wave. Under, under the gang wave, most times, you will see umbilicals. Human beings are going on top. On the other side, on the flip side, it's wire, wire, your umbilicals. You fasten them there to take uh, connections from one platform to another. Okay. Then next we have um, dynamic umbilical. So, dynamic umbilical is used to connect floating structure such as FPSO to a main subsea manifold due to their ability to withstand dynamic fatigue motions, all right? And dynamic umbilicals that contain thermoplastic horses and cables will also contain two or three layers of steel wire armor, isn't it? Why are we having armor where we have umbilicals with plastics? So to, so to add to the structural integrity. All right. Then where we have steel tubes, we do not require armor. All right, but armor may be necessary. So you said? Yes. So, so have... dynamic umbilicals are the ones that hang off from top side to give a catenary shape and are under constant loading hmm? with continuous flexing and movement from our high sea current and vessel 
motions. Okay. And where we can have our dynamic umbilical is vessel to seabed. Do you agree to that? Vessel to seabed. Yes, yes, sir. Well, yes, yes. How about boy? Boy to seabed. Yes. All right. Then how about uh, vessel to platform? Sorry, sir. Let me let me ask a question. Yes. Um, so when you say boy, like what what do you mean in this case? I can remember yesterday when you were talking about um, the export prices. You said when we uh, make something similar to STS. When we are transferring crude from the maybe FPSO to a kind of badge or vessel that maybe oil tanker or something, you call it a boy. Yes. So, but like from my own background as a marine engineer, boys are kind of flotation devices. They are kind of what? Flotation devices. Okay. So, boy that we are talking about here is so in this in this case, what does the boy here? Yeah, what does it actually mean? They are offloading tankers or floating devices. Okay. That can help us to offload produce hydrocarbon. All right. Yes, sir. And when we talk about boy to seabed now, you know, we spoke about gas leaks. You might want to boost the gas from a particular production by adding gas to the system. That is where you can have a connection from your boy to your seabed. So that at the riser base, the boy is supplying gas so that from that riser base, your production is now moving faster. Do you get it? No, sir. Just like when you have a. Can you please lift. come again? It was kind of breaking a bit. I said, just like when you have the gas lift. So see it now that your gas supply is supplied from, uh, is gotten from the boy. You can connect an umbilical to supply gas from the boy to your riser base to help to. Uh, increase the flow rates of production at that point back top side. All right. You understand? Right, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Then we have a vessel to platform. So you might want to connect a vessel to a platform and the type of umbilical you use at that point is uh, dynamic because the vessel will always be in dynamic motion and same thing as vessel to vessel. All right? Yes, sir. So, uh, we can, yes, sir. can stop at this point. We'll continue from umbilical variance tomorrow and uh, we'll take it from there. Any questions so far? Perhaps tomorrow, sir. Okay, no problem. So I will send you today's material. Answer the, the material, sir. All right. I'm just talking about that. Yeah. I will send you today's material via WhatsApp so that you disseminate with your group. All right, sir. Continue with your fluid study from eight to 10. They will meet by 10. You can see that the flip study really helped. This helped you or did it not help you? Hello?